Human psychology, and we'll call it cognitive biases, drive our decision making. We almost don't even realize it. It's like subconsciously happening. Welcome to Make Your Money Matter. I'm your host, Brad Barrett. I'm also a managing director and partner here at One Capital Management. I'm here each and every week to help you navigate through this crazy journey of finances and investing because after all, your money matters. Friends, it's hard for us if you think about it as humans to remove any sort of emotions when it comes to certain things in our lives. I have a lot of family members who are first responders and military and what I've learned from their training and that training perspective is, you know, they're trained in a way to remove emotions. They have a system and an order in place and when things go wrong, the idea is, is to follow that system. The notion being to always go back to your training. Many of you might have heard that statement before. It's a very military type environment and the same thing is true of your money, yet many of us don't. And I've said this before, Every human in the world should have money in their wallet, but not in their heart. And I've spoken about this scripture before, but 1 Timothy 6.10 talks about this in the Bible. It's not the money itself that is bad. It's the love of money. And the love is an emotion. We get attached to it. If it sinks into our hearts and doesn't become you know, rational or logical, it's hard for us to decipher in money decisions. And so today, I'm going to be focusing on emotional investing, how we perceive money and how to conquer our emotions when making financial decisions. I'm gonna be talking about three in particular today, but before I do, smash that subscribe button, hit the notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. All right, let's get into it. Ralph Waldo Emerson, a famed essayist, poet, and many of us know him as a popular philosopher, once said, and I love this quote, money often costs too much. Now, my first question to everyone right now is, what does money mean to you? What do you think I mean by that? Or what do you think Walt Waldo Emerson means by money costs too much? And I've been talking a lot about this, uh, but the notion of money often costs too much has a lot to do with what we use our money for and more importantly, why. Why we do whatever we're doing with our money. And what we're gonna get into today when I talk about emotions is the why. Now, believe it or not, friends, we're about a month away from Valentine's Day. Now, my wife and I uh, were talking about it, and personally, we're not huge into that holiday. Uh, we just come off of my son happens to be born in December. We have Christmas and New Year's, and just for us, we just kind of say, let's just go out on a date, nothing fancy, nothing crazy. Now, I usually buy her some flowers, and I've learned in the past to do or not do certain things because it's interesting to me. Like being a financial advisor, let me give you an example. I'm like, hey, look, for $5, I can get my wife, Veronica, two flowers from a florist, or, I can get her an entire Costco rotisserie chicken. That's all I'm saying, friends. I mean, the choice is all of ours. Now, I've only been a husband for about 10 years, so many of you out there have uh, been husbands for 20 and 30 years. I will admit, probably not the best move to go get a rotisserie chicken, but whereas my mind at goes naturally is value and cost. And that's my pragmatic, logical mind. Uh, I'm going, you know, hey, she can get more out of that chicken than two flowers, but I digress. Now, we as a family can get more out of that as well, but how and why we choose to use our money has a lot to do with behavioral emotions. And be behavioral emotions, I think, before we get into any of the weekly discussions we're gonna have over the course of this year in 2023, this, I think, is a good one to start with. Now, I've said this for a long time. There's really three things human beings keep really close to our chest. If you're honest with yourself, ask yourself this. But the three things I've noticed are money, politics, and religion, and not necessarily in any particular order. But it's something that when you talk about finances in particular, it's almost like you're gonna go see an advisor or something like that. You have to have some trust because it's a financial, it almost feels like a financial undressing. It's it's somewhat uncomfortable. We may feel insecure. And many times we have a lot of people saying, man, I, I wish I'd done this 10 years ago. And the reason why you don't, and for many of you watching and listening right now, is because you really don't wanna look at it. It's something that's so uncomfortable that you just put it off. So now, what I wanna share with everybody, like I've shared the past couple of weeks on the Make Your Money Matter show, now's the time, friends. I mean, it's January, it's the new you, new you, the whole, the whole new me, new you thing, right? Let's focus on finances 
in whatever facet that might be for you. Now, it might be getting the plan, the financial plan in order, it might be reviewing the plan you currently have. It might be taking a look at your distributions, getting out of debt. Maybe you're getting closer to retirement or becoming financially free and trying to figure out you know, all of that stuff and how that looks. Map it out. Now is the time to do it. Now, if I said this before, I love this quote. The only difference, remember, between success and failure is taking action. That said, human psychology, and we'll call it cognitive biases, drive our decision making. We almost don't even realize it. It's like subconsciously happening. It's how our brain is wired. And if you look at the design God implemented within our brains, it was designed to protect us. It runs its offensive and defensive programs pretty much at all times. And you can go into the many theories on this, and I won't go into all the details here, although I'm, to be completely candid, I'm a total nerd about that kind of stuff, especially as it relates to money. And I, I read up on all this stuff all the time, and I love understanding how it works and why. And our brain is designed differently than our hearts are. We have two minds going on. I talk about this a lot. We have our logical and our rational, which is our brain. And then we have our emotional, the stomach. And it's hard, if you really think about all our decisions we make every day, it's hard to separate those two. You know, I noticed the other day on social media, maybe it was Facebook or, or something, there was actually an influencer out there who in my mind, to be fair, has no business really talking about money and he's an influencer in the money and investing space. But the reality is he starts talking about the DIYs, the do-it-yourselfers and saying, you don't need an advisor, you don't need you know, investment counsel, you can do it yourself. And now, mind you, this isn't, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to poo-poo that idea necessarily. I, that's fine if that you can do that. I'm a big believer in if you feel like you can do it, great. And our job as advisors is to partner with those who feel like we can be better together. But one of the things he said, and this, and his whole argument, by the way, was based on this one theory. And he says this very quickly and he goes, if you can take the emotion out of it, dot, dot, dot. Like he just like glazes over that. Right. And then he starts going into his whole rant about why you don't need an advisor and this, that, and the other. And to me, my brain being an advisor for nearly two decades stops right there. Again, he glazed over this whole thing and it was obvious he was doing this on purpose because to me, you know, and I think we all can share this, like you, you can't not have emotions in anything you do. That was his caveat, his out, if you will. And his caveat was exactly that. He threw out something key to financial planning, which in my opinion, tells me you're not necessarily a financial or licensed or, or credentialed or fiduciary advisor. And if you've seen this, or, or if you're hearing that out there, the only way to take the emotions out of anything to do with your money in particular is to not be human. It like basically makes you a robot. You can't do it. We aren't designed that way. It's very hard, dare I say almost impossible, to do that. It's asking someone who's a circle to try to beat a square. It's just not gonna happen. So it's important for us to talk about the emotions when it comes to your investing. And I'm also sharing this completely, not naive to the fact that we just came off a year like 2022 where tumultuousness happened, volatility happened, and our emotions, let's be candid here, tend to kick up more during those kind of times, correct? And when it comes to investing, what I've noticed is most people will discuss the math, the numerical part of it, and they'll forget sometimes the most important part, which is the actual discipline. You can run math all day long, but actually implementing it is a whole separate matter. That's something I preach every week. And by discipline, what I mean, it helps you remove the emotions. It's your set of systems, as I mentioned earlier, to go back to. So with that said, I wanna talk about three in particular, three cognitive biases that are impacting your investments, whether you realize it or not. And I wanna bring back three of them in particular because I think these three have come up mostly that I've seen in reviews with clients and in our perspective calls from our radio programs, from our, our show here in the past 13, 14 months. And as each of you know, one of the things I like bringing up on my weekly conversations with my clients and really letting you know what you know your brethren are doing out there and what they're feeling, because when we start feeling things, as my son says, right, we are starting to get into our emotions and that's okay. And I think nowadays, more than ever, it's important to talk about that kind of stuff because back in the day, we would just bottle it up, we'd white knuckle it, and we would do things and just that's how we did it, right? But now is a good time. And I think the format out there in the world, like something like this platform allows us to talk more about it. And especially, you know, for me to talk about these kind of things as it relates to something as important as your money. When you get into your car, typically you know where you're going, right? You're going to the grocery store, you're gonna pick up the kids, you can go to work, you're coming home from work, whatever it might be, you know where you are going. 
And if you think about it in doing that, you're removing the emotions. You don't realize it because it kind of happens subconsciously. It's your motor skills, right? It just happens. It's a motor skill. It's autopilot. We just have our brain trained to do it. 7 a.m. in the morning, I go to get my coffee. I go to the car. From the car, I go to work. And it's just like autopilot. So our brain knows how to do it. We don't necessarily take that into the money world, into our investing or our retirement. Because arguably, save for the few that have you know, crazy traffic days or stuff that just was out of nowhere, hopefully not an accident or something, you know, bad, but your success rate is pretty high from getting from home to office. And the reason for that, I think, is that basis of removing emotions. And I think now more than ever in the past 20 years, the noise is loud. And by noise, I mean Twitter, social media, CNN, Fox, whatever it might be, the noise is loud. Or the red ticker, you know, at the bottom of any screen that you're watching is just selling fear and what they want you to know that day. And I'm not saying it's not factual or it's not important. What I'm saying is it's not the water around a boat that sinks a ship. It's the water that gets in. And if we're letting that stuff in, then all of a sudden we're going from our logical and rational mind and we're filtering it down and now it's hitting our emotional. So it's taking this journey from the rational, perceiving it, seeing it, hearing it, listening to it, and then all of a sudden feeling it. And when what we do with those feelings is what we want to talk about. That's what I want to talk about today. Why we react and ultimately why, remember the big point here is why, why we potentially would deviate from a discipline or a plan that we put in place. And by the way, if you haven't done that, now's the time to do it. You can reach out to us. You can have a discussion with your advisor. Now's the time to put the plan in place. So three cognitive biases I want to talk about are this, the bandwagon effect, otherwise known as groupthink, neglect of probability, and anchoring biases. These three I want to bring back to the forefront as we start January 2023 fresh. And understanding these biases, I believe, can lead to better decision making. I mean, this is a fundamental aspect, in my opinion, to ultimately lowering risk and really improving your investment returns over time while also providing you peace of mind. I mean, that's what everyone's striving for. It's not necessarily to make a big shift in what you're investing in, but maybe it's a big shift in how you're investing. And the first one I want to talk about is what's known in economics as the bandwagon effect, or as I said before, it's what some people call or refer to as groupthink. This is the effect where one will, one person will gain comfort in something because many other people do or believe the same thing. And I think we see this most often on things like social media platforms, Twitter, Reddit, Discord groups, whatever it might be. And we see it all over the place. I mean, Instagram, Facebook, whatever it might be. And it is key, I think, to be able to analyze and think independently. We should do that in all of our lives, frankly. Whatever the conversation might be, you gotta take that and, and go into your house and think about why. Why would I wanna do that? Why would that make sense for me and my family? One of the things I think the biggest benefit of an advisor for each one of you is to actually remove yourself from the group. I totally understand it. it it's a beautiful thing. There's, there's comfort in knowing others out there are doing the same things, uh, they're thinking the same thing, and we almost feel like we have this like backing, like we have this group, like this brethren or, or something like that. There's nothing wrong with it, but when it comes to your money, it's important to make sure that you take whatever it is you're discussing and remove yourself for a second and talk to someone who's professional about why that would make sense for you or maybe not make sense for you, not necessarily the other people in the group. I mean, one of the group things right now that's going on is largely around things like NFTs and Bitcoin and crypto. And, you know, as I've shared many times, I'm well aware that it's an investing asset class at this point, but I don't know that it needs to be, as I've shared before, the driver's seat of your investment. It could be a passenger. And more than that, I don't think you should be paying driver's seat costs or prices for what I would consider a backseat investment. It's okay to have some of it out there and do it, but don't necessarily move your entire portfolio and ride the lightning on whatever it might be. Careful of groupthink. It's really important. In fact, Warren Buffett once said, the worst mistake you can make in stocks is to buy or sell stocks based on current headlines. This is why market bubbles, by the way, are typically, if you look at it, the result of groupthink or herd mentality. There's a bubble. People are following the herd, if you will. And I've shown you this a lot, but our philosophy at One Capital has been over nearly two decades now. And for many of my clients watching or listening right who've worked with us over the past decade in particular, you know, we've been doing this and we've seen really great results from a discipline and discerning investment approach. And that's what we call, you know, uncorrelated assets. We know that 
you know, diversification is important. And that word is, I know it can be overused sometimes, but in our nerd world, we call that almost uncorrelated. Basically, essentially in the same economic environment, we might have two positions that work inversely to each other. It's not part of groupthink. It allows us to make sure that we pick up the upside when markets are up, but also manage the downside. And we've been doing that all throughout this year because that's really, as I've said this a lot, when an advisor rolls up their sleeves and the old term of earns their keep is in a down year. It doesn't take rocket science to make money when the markets are up. The salt of any good advisor comes down to very simply when markets are down. It's part of sticking to a plan, understanding your discipline, your discerning decision-making with your investments, making sure that we're dollar cost averaging, actively managing through the downturn and protecting your downside. I've shared this, some of my uh, clients have heard this before, uh, back to the you know notion of first responders and military and our family, it was a notion of protecting your six, right? It's the same way when you run into a tactical engagement, you need someone protecting your six. It's the same way we approach money management. And to that note, I'll never forget, I got a client probably 10, 11 years ago that made the comment to me that you sucked less than most. And to me at the time, it was kind of like a backhanded compliment, but when the market was off, I don't remember the number exactly. When the market was off, we were down half as much. That's the salt of a good advisor of managing risk just as much as it is picking up on the upside. So one way to provide non-groupthink, if you will, into a portfolio is having uncorrelated positions. All right, number two, neglect of probability. This happens when people assume a, a single point estimate when making investment decisions. The reality is, you know, the outcome any investor has in mind is their best or most probable estimate. But there are a distribution of possible outcomes. And we have to study this. Um, it's actually the risk in a portfolio is called standard deviation. It's understanding, you know, like a, a scenario behind this is a Monte Carlo scenario. It basically shows a thousand possibilities of all the situations that could arise with a given portfolio in a given allocation. And here's why I'm bringing this one up. I see this a lot with clients or investors that have a, a, a bullish position that actually may truly be just volatile, hint, hint, crypto or things like Tesla. I'm not picking on those necessarily. And I don't want to speak to whether they're good or bad for you necessarily as individual positions, but I'm mentioning what I've seen. And most know it's somewhat volatile, but they actually don't factor it into their decision making. It somewhat extends or dovetails off a of number one that I brought up, groupthink. Most know it's volatile. We, we all see that. But this can lead to investor being what I've seen as too heavily weighted in a specific investment, you know, and, and that's your long money. I mean, diversified good value in growth stocks doesn't mean that something like my examples of crypto or Tesla or all these ones that have come up, okay, doesn't mean those can't be a passenger in the car, in the portfolio, in my example. Just make sure they're the right allocations. So when I talk about the cognitive bias or the emotion around that, what I have called neglected probability, we're almost neglecting the probable outcome of a volatile situation simply because our mind is set on something that we perceive as good. And that perception comes from, really stems off of number one, groupthink. It comes from you know being validated by others. Again, not right or wrong. Emotions don't have a right or wrong. It's just something for us to bring to the forefront as we make sure we think about it. And that frontal cortex of our minds that helps us rationalize our emotional investing. And in my example earlier, I firmly believe that unless you become a robot, you cannot remove emotions from investing. So understanding them, understanding how they operate, the conscious and the subconscious level when you're doing anything, whether it's investing you know, in, in, in a certain asset class, investing in a 401k, an IRA, a trust account, investing in your house, paying off debt is an investment because you're paying yourself back, right? Whatever it is you're doing, Think about the emotions behind it and making sure that it you can stick to your plan. That's what I call my two Ds, discipline and discernment. All right, last but not least, the third one I wanna bring up today. And again, there's a lot of them out there. These three I think are really important. I've seen them in the past year, which is why I wanna bring them up. The third one's anchoring bias. This one's important. This is the bias to rely too heavily on a past reference or maybe one piece of information when you make a decision. Now. I often see this in the investing world with share prices, you know, and, and technical analysts will do this a lot and they base, you know, share prices on charting, you know, versus fundamental economics of the company or the sector or the industry. And, and to bring it even more relevant, this is also what happens in our life outside of money. We tend to think 
where we've gone before and what we've seen, that brings us into our current situation and we react to certain good and bad scenarios that are gonna be exactly like what you've gone through. And to be fair, we all react to things that we've already gone through and when we bring it into our current reality and when we talk about investing, going back to that for a second, you bring in this, this world and I see it in the technical world of where we're just kind of charting prices and seeing where it's been and oh, it's been there before and in the same environment, so it's gonna do it again, right? But we're totally neglecting the actual fundamentals of the company. Whereas share price has been in the past presents to me, no information as to whether or not a stock is cheap or expensive. That's really important to know. Now, granted, this is coming from a fundamental investor. And as a firm, we tend to be more on the fundamental side of things. And we believe in that notion, but really think about it. What's the old saying? Past performance doesn't reflect future gains. History tends to repeat itself, but not necessarily in numerical data. So where a share price has been in the past to me presents little to no information of where it's gonna go in the future. You know, we should assess, in my opinion, whether or not the share price is trading at a discount compared to an assessment of what we'll call intrinsic value or fundamental value. We can use that uh, through, you know, different studies of earnings per share. We can use it through price to earnings ratios, dividend yields, a whole host of information that is readily available to us, you know, charting some course or technical analysis, just because we think it's down doesn't necessarily mean it's going to go back up just because it's down from its peak and it has to go back up. So the three I mentioned, I think are really important, especially as we start here in January of 2023. But the reality is what I want to bring up is this is a time to be honest and candid with yourself. And that's why I want to speak to you individually. I'm allowed this platform each week. And I love the fact that you're all here watching and listening because these three things I brought up, bandwagon effect, group think, um, or neglect of probability and anchoring bias are all things that I believe we should all be looking at and asking ourselves. And I want to end on something that doesn't necessarily have to do with the three things I just brought up, but has a lot of tie in to our emotions and how we think about money. And I, I think I'm speaking to someone right now whether you're watching or listening, that most of us, if we really are honest with ourselves, as I shared with what we need to be today, is we spend money to impress people. The whole keeping up with the Joneses. I'm not immune to this. I'm a human. My wife and I talk about this all the time. But I found myself asking a question that I think is really a, a great one for all of us. And that is, if no one saw that I bought this, would I still want it? And I'll share with you, that question has saved me a lot of money over time. And as we talk about emotional investing, behavioral financial traits, you know, when you really go into the marketing of the world, it's really hitting our psychology nowadays more than anything. And our psychology, when it's hit, tends to hit our pocketbook, our wallet. As I shared before, money should be in your wallet, but not in your heart. So really be a, a, a good question and good sound counsel to yourself. And I just want to share that because as I was thinking about this show and writing it and going through some of these items when it comes to behavioral financial traits and, and the psychology of it, um, I just think that one I wanted to share is really ask yourself, if no one saw I bought this item or, or, or did anything you were doing for, that cost money, would you still want to buy it or would you still want to do it? Before we go, though, if you found anything helpful today and want to learn more, visit our website at onecapital.com. You can also scan the QR code on the screen with your smartphone to get you there. You can also call or text us. We want to help. Listen, there's no pressure here. We don't treat people like a number. In fact, we value our relationships. It's the lifeblood of what we do. So click call or text us today. And if you're not following us on social media, you should be. You can follow us at Make Your Money Matter. We're sharing great information across all of our platforms. And as I often say on our show, if you enjoy the show, share it with someone you like. I guess if you don't like it, share it with someone you don't like. But until next week, always remember, make your money matter.